Welcome back to my series on Franco Alpers, the lieutenant who is accused of trying to topple the state with a vintage gun and claiming it on a refugee. I have spent the first video explaining how the media and the authorities became aware of him in the first place. The second one to line out the evidence they gave to the wider public to support their claim. The third to uh, present the the evidence of the thought crime hunters because people do not accept you to think whatever you want. And uh, the fourth video on uh, his associations. Um, the contacts he had, the social environment. This video will be about the background, the cultural um, roots of this witch hunt, um, or at least about some of it, because I think uh, it's it's unnecessary to mention that this place has always been a place for witch hunts, including the real witch hunts, but also dating back long before that, uh, the Inquisition, the anti-Semitic pogroms against the, the Black Death, uh, and so forth. Um, this place has been prone to um, witch hunts and um, um, never checking accusations, always exaggerating them, um, um, seeing people dying on the stake or in the gas chambers uh, for the weirdest accusations. It has always been like this. There's this general tendency that has been on, going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. But I wanted to speak about the newer cultural shifts that led to the climate that we are in, uh, that sees the history, um, this long-standing dragon waken up again. I begin with a look at uh, his master thesis that he wrote for the Ecole Spéciale Militaire de Saint-Cyr. Um, it was ultimately not committed, so I don't have the full paper in front of me. I just uh, saw the table of content and what drew my interest was chapter 1.3 about a book called The Pentagon's New Map by Thomas P. M. Barnett. Uh, Barnett is a former um, military officer with the U.S. Air Force and uh, had been the head of a Israeli think tank, has uh, gone on to be an author of books and also a public speaker and a blogger. He also is a dreadful person and if you think that Ben Shapiro and Dennis Prager were full of themselves, you have not yet listened to Thomas P. M. Barnett. But I can invite you to check it out on your own. Don't trust my word. He is incredibly arrogant. It's, it's unbearable to watch. It's really difficult. And like many people who are um, overestimating themselves, he is using old, old concepts and slaps new names on it um, to present himself as an intellectual. And so he is uh, describing the concept of a hegemony. Um, he is using uh, the word uh, functional core for the hegemon and uh, a non-integrating gap for the, the lands that are not um, under full control or under lesser control of the power centers. Um, he is a an avid globalist, uh, an, a migration um, proponent, and um, he has this idea that um, the the functional core um, is is um, helping these uh, non-integrating gaps if uh, he if the functional core is drawing them into their sphere of power. So of course this is the kind of idea that power-hungry people in any hegemon wants to hear. Um, and uh, it sounds a bit like this. Um, I, I re read from the Wikipedia description of, of, his, uh, of his thoughts. The new rule sets project was one of many programs that the United States military has launched since the fall of the Soviet Union in order to determine what threats will emerge in the coming decades. The project is a unique collaboration between military and financial analysts. The project name came from the idea of rule sets, the combination of written and unwritten rules that people with, uh, within a region use. So what he is of course referring to is uh, the laws and unwritten rules, the morals and values of a population. And uh, like many people on this uh, on on the left fringe and on uh, the globalist front uh, they think the rules are arbitrary um they have an the, the only reason for them is to simply order the population um, below them and uh, they, they they shall not have any real purpose whatsoever beyond that stabilizing power stabilizing function and these non-integrating gaps 
are supposedly benefiting from um, the expansion of a, a given rule set uh, into these areas. By that um, token, they also transform these rules. And of course, Western values, democracy, and um, the American system, and so on, they are all um, disposable, basically. They are negotiable uh, in the higher interest of um, gaining more power for the power elites in the hegemon. Wikipedia writes, uh, for instance, the US and the Soviet Union had rules that, that were very different. Once the Soviets lost control, the, the country went through a rule set reset, organizing itself to more closely align with the largely democratic and capitalist society it had once opposed. Um, but that does not mean that America would not give up its rules to gain power for the elites. Uh, Wikipedia writes, at the Naval War College, Barnett served as director of the new rule sets project, an effort uh, designed to explore how the spread of globalization alters the basic uh, rules of the road in the international security environment. And I think also that goes beyond that. Um, the freedom of speech is, is now uh, negotiable in America itself. Um, with special reference to how these uh, changes redefined US military's historic rule as a security enabler of America's commercial network ties uh, with the world. So it's not only negotiable that the rule sets of values, uh, the constitution, uh, and also the religion of the hegemon changes, um, the, the the countries in between, they are also not okay as they are, of course, and um, they only benefit from uh, power aggregation in the hands of uh, the, the elites in the hegemon. Uh, Wikipedia writes, the central thesis of his geopolitical theory is that the connections the globalization brings between countries, in brackets including network connectivity, financial transactions, and media flows, are synonymous with those countries with stable governments, rising standards of li living, and more death by suicide than by murder. Um, these countries form the functioning core. So they form it, they, they move, merge with the hegemon uh, into one rule set, and um, also they connect, and this connection in itself just benefits everybody. There are no downsides to it. Of course, this is stuff that we have all heard hundreds of times, like the, the trades are beneficial to everybody and so on, and there's no real discussion in, in all of this. There is nothing original about his thinking in the first place, but you can imagine this is exactly what certain groups want to hear, and that is why he is, um, why, why he actually wrote what he wrote. He is a narcissist in the first place. Um, so it's, it sounds it sounds very uh, very intellectual, but uh, basically um, he he's lining out that everybody benefits if if people do what the hegemon's elites uh, want them to do, um, and uh, the the rules um, you know with which the population in the hegemon uh, used to live, like dem democratic rules, freedom um, in itself is um, disposable um, or at least negotiable for these elites. Wikipedia writes, the group also noticed that globalization has caused a fairly common rule set to be shared between a great many countries around the world. States that have benefited from globalization and begun to share in the wealth and prosperity associated with that are also losing interest in waging war with one another. Um, so here we have it again, the one one size fits all globalist um, ideology is, is espoused here. And another talking point that uh, swept over the, the big pond from, uh, from Europe to America is included here, that somehow this globalized one size fits all rule set is stopping nations from waging war. Now I ask you, how many countries can you name that are officially waging war against other nations? You know, that is something that strikes me again and again when I talk about current policies. You do no longer understand what problem our elites are trying to solve. Um, there are barely any nations that are in formal wars with other nations. There are informal wars. Uh, there is uh, the war between um, Saudi Arabia and Iran. There is a war between India and Pakistan. But these are uh, conflicts driven by a majority or by groups within these nations that are just simply setting the tone. Um, 
in in you know in the conflict Pakistan and uh, uh, India, it is actually the conflict Muslims versus Hindus, and that that same conflict also takes place inside India, and it's the same truth with all these other uh, conflicts. You have groups pitted against each other, and the nations that uh, gives them access to a military force, they do not play the role. They are not the cause for the conflicts between these groups. Um, so the the um, the, the elites are solving a problem that does no longer exist. It does no longer exist. It's solved. They solve a problem that has already been solved. And the same is true for the environmentalists. They are solving problems that are already solved. Uh, they find um, chemicals in ponds in, in a, a concentration that is completely healthy and still they complain and so on. And our elites, they have decided to create problems. The microaggression problem is another one. Um, so they can um, deal with themselves and, you know, play around and um, use that time for something while they can ignore the big problems that the, pop the population is concerned with. Solving all these problems that are already solved, Barnett um, suggests that America assumes the role of a system administrator. Um, again, um, he is actually describing something that you will recognize in a moment, um, but uses fancy uh, terminology to uh, sound smarter than he is. Um, so uh, take a look. The rest? wider array of partners, international organizations, non-governmental organizations, private voluntary organizations, contractors. You're not going to get away from that. Leviathan Force is all about joint operations between the military services. We're done with that. What we need to do is interagency operations, which frankly Condi Rice was in charge of. It was Condoleezza Rice that was in charge of um, connecting and linking up all these different organizations, international bodies, um, NGOs, private uh, voluntary organizations, um, contractors, um, and so on. And um, her style of politics, as well as her comrades, were usually described with a label that I issue for most of the time, um, but uh, is worth discussion, and that is that of the neocons. Uh, there is this fear, and I completely understand it, that the uh, crowing of the military force of, the, of America led to a... Um, a bloating of the government itself, that uh, the in industry had become dependent on government contractors uh, in too many places, and that it changed also the minds of the people. And a famous example of that, in my opinion, is uh, John McCain, who uh, grew up basically within the military structures, and when he ran for president, he, he did not know anything uh, taking care of whatever problem there is. So absurdly enough, it is the military that uh, ended up to be uh, the weak point in the Western world that uh, kind of let the, the Soviets uh, prevail in the end. Um, if we can't stop this, um, it is, it is uh, this attitude that has grown over the last decades that the state can provide for everything and uh, the international bodies uh, have just gained too much power with that, with these links and uh, their structures and what they do is just assumed to be good in, in itself um, and uh, the state has um, come to um, create these state actors, which they are basically, uh, and make them look as if they were non-governmental, and that's what they what they call themselves, non-governmental organizations. Many of them are paid by taxpayer money. While I'm saying this, um, Mr. Barnett, Thomas P. M. Barnett, is not the force behind all of this. Uh, this has been growing for for decades. It is also not the neoconservative movement that really changed so much as people assume. I think it was a slow um, weakening of the fabric of our nations, and um, it, it just came with a governmental growth and the military growth that um, just seemed to justify a lot of it in the first place. Um, and I'm stressing this because there are a lot of people who um, like conspiracy theories and being at that I return to uh, Franco Albrecht's um, master thesis where he uh, speaks about uh, um, conspiracy theories in chapter 3.2. Mr. Barnett and many other actors that are often quoted 
tend to be just observers of what is going on. Uh, narcissists who say something that other people want to hear um, are usually not the creators of the desires. Um, they just are writing it down what is already there. So what we actually want to discuss is the milieu. And Mr. Barnett does not hold a high position whatsoever. His book is not so widely read uh, and so on. And these things do not happen somewhat uh, behind the doors. It is all in the open. We all could have actually seen this coming. We were just busy with other uh, things. Our attention was not there before. That's all there is. It has been in the open for decades, uh, this uh, growth of the military and the linking uh, of their forces with the NGOs or this do-gooders um, and pseudo um, priests we've uh, grown used to. And while America became too trusting with the military leaders and allowed its uh, growth um, to spread into other areas of their politics and the welfare uh, areas as well as foreign aid and industrial uh, policies and so forth. Um, Europe went the other direction. We had our state growing and growing and growing outside the military force and uh, to the same extent that American freedoms uh, become ever more dependent on the goodwill of our elites. Um, but we are extremely suspicious if not hostile to our military and um, this showed when Franco Albrecht was arrested. Not only was his room searched and his base searched but all military bases um, of the Bundeswehr and uh, they were conducting a, an iconoclasm into old stuff. Everything that has something to do with the Wehrmacht or older uh, militaries like the Reichswehr um, had to be removed, uh, including a portrait of our former Chancellor Helmut Schmidt. Uh, the Helmut Schmidt University in Hamburg had a portrait of his uh, hanging in a community room. It had to be removed and it had to be removed because Helmut Schmidt is wearing a uniform of the Wehrmacht. How ridiculous is that? Ursula von der Leyen, who is the president of the EU Commission at the moment, used to be the defense minister at the time and uh, she called the witch hunt and the crackdown, the ideology crackdown in our military a uh, Säuberungs- und Reinigungsprozess, a process of cleaning and purging. If you had seen my previous videos, I've mentioned it once, we have this habit of uh, enumerating stuff that mean the very same thing. So she calls it openly a purge uh, that occurred. Um, uh, she announced it on the 10th of May uh, 2017, so shortly after the arrest of Franco Albrecht, and she justified that purge with his arrest. Of course, this iconoclasm was an expression of the overall skepticism towards our military. That has many reasons. Uh, for one, there is this um, selective pacifism that the left has. Um, whenever Western troops advance, for example, you immediately find a, pa a pacifist protest in the street. Uh, whenever somebody else, uh, communists or Islamists, uh, advance their troops, their terrorists, and so on, you hear nothing. Um, that is one reason and we are a very left-wing country. The second one is uh, the described middle position between hegemonial powers. Uh, Germany has had a hard time to kind of accept uh, freedom. There's this nice line uh, that I can't really trace back to the book where it comes from. Uh, you may leave me a comment if you know. Um, freedom is the hardest thing to learn. And this is really something that uh, one should remember when you discuss um, nations that had have a democratic structure only for a number of decades. Uh, because freedom does not only mean that um, you can do what you want, it also means, and that's a difficult part, somebody else does something that you do not want, right? And for many terms, um, there had always been this, um, why are Americans better than Soviets? I mean, of course, even an idiot could tell that the Soviets treated their citizens much worse than the United States ever had. But the left has a talent in finding every hair in the soup and zoom in on the smallest mistakes uh, so as to portray uh, both sides as equally uh, um, problematic. And, um, you know, with that uh, location really in between those two main forces, uh, Trump had a, a hard time to decide 
what who is the good guy and counting corpses and military engagements and so on had been a pastime activity for a lot of uh, Germans, I must say. And this context um, being protected by America against the Soviets, Western Germans had an easy time to uh, uh, be in crates and um, point their fingers on America and say, look, you are a military power. How dare you do something that the Wehrmacht did? Um, that, that was kind of the obsession. And you also find a similar obsession Germans have with Israel. Um, and um, this is a long standing issue the pretense that uh, we are nice, uh, peace loving, uh, one, uh, one with nature uh, kind of people some kind of Pocahontas native um, population while the Americans are occupiers um, uh, who are forcing um, our elites to do these horrendous things like um, mass immigration at the moment for example is a very common um, idea okay it, it's still it's still around uh, but what drives this particular purge and this particular iconoclasm in our elites is I think something else and so I want to talk a little bit about an event that has a bigger impact than many people realized um, and that is the cultural and psychological impact of the failed coup d'etat attempt in Turkey 2016. That is wildly under discussed. It was a tremendous thing, a tremendous shift. And the reason for this is that Erdogan, a man that you probably hate and a lot of people do hate, is an ally of our elites. Uh, it's not quite clear why he is an ally, why he is still in NATO. I know you can tell me a good game on um, the military bases, the, the harbors, the aircraft carriers and stuff. Uh, and it is the, I think, the third largest military in the NATO. But is, it, is Turkey really in the NATO because of these things? And if push came to shove, would it really be the case that Erdogan would side with us against whatever force uh, is against us? Um, I'm very suspicious. And um, still, he is an ally of our elites. It's, and he was almost overthrown on the 15th of July 2016 by a group that called itself Peace at Home Council. Now, if you had looked into recent Turkish history, you may have found out that there is an ongoing civil war that our media is blatantly ignoring. This council was probably a, a group of people that was dissatisfied with all the arrests, with all the torture um, rumors, with all the um, clamp down on free speech. I mean, that's enormous. They, they, de they don't even have Wikipedia and stuff. It's, it's, it's it's horrendous um, and um, it is really hard to find who was actually behind that after the fact and it was not one of those long-standing groups that you would suspect behind such a coup like the Camelists who used to run the country for a number of decades after it um, went from the Otto, uh, Ottoman Empire into a republic the Turkish Republic um, and it is also not the, the Kurds um, and uh, it was really hard to pin who these people were. And what the Turkish government did is uh, it defied over a number of years, um, already prior to that actual coup, uh, a terror group only a number of years before that. Um, it's probably more of a, a phantom of the uh, Turkish elites than an actual um, organization. And that is the followership of the preacher Fethullah Gülen. Uh, spelled with an L. Um, Guyen is a Sunni priest. Um, he lives in Pennsylvania right now, in a small, um, in a small town called uh, Salisburg, or rather a farm near Salisburg. Um, and he used to be an influential speaker in Turkey until he had to, um, he had to run away in 1999. Um, he was denaturalized, that means he was um, taken away his citizenship in 2017. And the people that were blamed on that coup d'etat are supposedly followers of his cult. That's sometimes how the how their enemies call them. But if you want to dig 
into what uh, what the Guyan movement is actually doing, who they are, what they are about, you find a very loose description. It seems that um, everybody who meets up in a in a room with a number of other people and selects somebody to read out of the Quran or other scripts, um, unguided um, and with a changing set of um, you know ch choices for who is to speak um, and who is to read. Um, anybody is branded as Guyen, at least those who are not a part of the Muslim Brotherhood, who ironically enough are linked uh, with the Erdogan regime. Um, so what we have is actually people who do no longer want to be told what Islam is and want to have a look uh, at the scripture themselves and talk with others about what they see in front of their eyes. So what we have here is actually um, a lot like Western conservatives. It's like normal free thinking people uh, just aggregating in, in different places, hiding out, uh, talking to each other about whatever, however they see the world, you know, without a, a predefined set of rules you have to follow or a predefined ideology. It's, it seems a very loosely defined term and still their enemies. Um, and you, you find the same stuff with Western conservatives. You find the stuff with um, the, the accusations, you find them with um, AFD, you find them with Trump, you find that with the Tories. The accusation is that they are authoritarian and that they are um, um, a cult, uh, a cult. You know, you, ha you don't have, you don't have scripture, there's no Guyan scripture, you don't have uh, priests outside of himself. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, a change, every, every, every meeting sees a different person to speak. It's not like anything is, is really in, um, in stone, set in stone. Um, so there's, uh, it is a very vibrant uh, group of people and still they, they are defamed as this authoritarian movement and some call them Islamists because they dare to look into the Quran themselves and those, uh, some people are Kamalists and I have to explain that um, uh, Kemal Ataturk, um, the, the founder Mustafa uh, Kemal, uh, Mustafa Kemal was actually his real name. Um, Atatürk was his title, uh, meaning the father of Turkey. And when he came to power, he just gave different orders to the um, religion ministry. The Turks make a lot of fuss over their supposed secularism or laicite because it was taken from uh, France, supposedly. Um, or like click as it is called in Turkish. Uh, what they mean is not the separation of state and religion that you would expect in the West. It is that the Ministry for Religion, the Dianet, is simply um, telling people to do different things. So before Atatürk came to power, the Dianet told people to grow beards, I mean men, uh, to grow beards as it's commanded in the Quran. Um, after the Turk men sh uh, shoved their beards. I'm personally not interested in fashion and I don't care, um, but the Kemalists just claim because, at least from the outlook, um, the DNA's uh, um, sermons uh, look a bit more like Western, um, Western ideas. Uh, but they are not. Uh, Western ideas are that you can say and think what the hell you want and you can actually scrutinize the scripture on your own and decide what you like and what you do not like. That's uh, Western, uh, the, the Western approach to, um, uh, to secularism. And uh, if you tell people that God wants this and not that, you are not doing lyricism. You are just uh, you are just bossing people around. That is not Western. Okay, that's just authoritarian. And the same people who say if we don't boss people around, the Islamists, the Muslim Brotherhood, um, they are also shaved. I mean, that's the tell-all. And it's um, it's a group that gave as a spin off the Al Qaeda. So you can tell that only because people are shaved does not mean that they are good. Good. So um, that is um, not enough. That's not enough, um, and um, the the idea um, that um, this genuine movement that calls itself a uh, chimat sometimes, which means congregation, it just means people meet, okay, or the hismet, which means service. That's how they call themselves. It's just people serving or going to a service to a religious service, or the gien um, hureketi uh, for those that link that movement to this preacher in Pennsylvania. Uh, um, 
this uh, original movement just looks so much like uh, Western conservatives that our elites become extremely nervous when people like those are behind a, a coup d'etat that could have toppled one of their allies. Despite the violence, uh, the sympathies were rather with the uh, rebels than with the government in Turkey, and our elites took note. Um, I want you to listen to Barbara Walter, who uh, serves as a professor for the School of Global Policy and Strategy in San Diego, the U UC San Diego. Uh, she is a far left uh, liberal uh, person, um, and it's not that I buy everything that she says, I just think that the thought, the idea that she offers is worthwhile listening to for, uh, for a moment at least. Uh, take a listen. And um, one of our jobs is to try to come up with predictive models um, for where political violence is likely to emerge. And it turns out um, that two of the best predictors of whether a country um, will experience both political instability, but they also include um, armed conflict going all the way up to civil war, is um, whether a country is moving towards or away from democracy. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be that we, we just thought that um, civil wars broke out as countries were become, moving from authoritarianism to democracy, but now we're seeing that they tend to break out when it's going in the opposite direction. And it tends to break out a little differently as countries move up the democratic ladder. Um, it takes a while for armed conflict to break out. If they're moving down the democratic ladder, it tends to be relatively rapid. Um, also, when, when countries are moving up the democratic ladder and experience war, oftentimes it starts as a military coup. That's not the case in the opposite direction. It tends to occur out of the formation of militias um, or um, as a result of large-scale demonstrations that, that turn violent. Um, if Walter is correct about um, how the military and the militias react towards a shift either to or from democracy. Um, that would mean maybe in Turkey until the year 2016 we saw an overall improvement in uh, in terms of um, a better freedoms, um, more, more prosperity in Turkey. And um, I think that is that is correct. I think that's actually what happened. Um, it, uh, you could see the economy was, was booming before that and uh, you also you saw uh, a lot of rebelliousness among Turks um, up until that uh, that day, okay? And I think our elites in the West took note because uh, uh, because of the sympathies we we obviously had with the, with the rebels in Turkey, uh, but also uh, they they wanted to make it um, to make it sure that it comes that no resistance comes from either place, uh, neither from the military nor from the private uh, sphere, and. Um, you will see that they had actually gone through a crackdown on both levels. Uh, but what affects this um, Franco Albrecht story most is probably uh, the crackdown on the military that followed uh, very swiftly. However, there's also the second level um, that you had to prepare the population for, for many, many years to allow such a thing as an ideological iconoclasm crackdown in the military without people getting um, uh, suspicious about this, you know, you would actually suspect in a stable society uh, that uh, the government, the elites soon have become nervous of their own security forces. I mean, this is um, something you you only expect in Africa <laughs> or in, in Asia and uh, suddenly we have it here and nobody is, is budging, nobody is saying something. Uh, we just took it for granted and this is because we had uh, the demonization, a low-level demonization of the military going on for a long time. Some of it is that um, leftist uh, pseudo-pacifism uh, that I've already mentioned, which found a quite a peculiar um, recent outlet in a speech of our foreign minister Heiko Maas. Have a listen. Es geht immer darum, wir müssen mehr Verantwortung übernehmen. Und gemeint ist damit, wir müssen mehr militärische Verantwortung übernehmen. Und liebe Genossinnen und Genossen, ich kann diese ganze Debatte wirklich nicht mehr hören. Zum einen, zum einen, weil sie uns glauben machen will, 
dass in den Krisen und Konflikten dieser Welt man wirklich militärisch Frieden schaffen kann. Das funktioniert nirgendwo und es hat auch nirgendwo funktioniert. It sounds like he has absolutely no awareness that it was the military that removed the anti-Semitic immigrant from Austria. Um, and that is not his only problem here. I think he is the voice of, um, of Germany in, in a way uh, that he plays this um, non-integrating gap uh, game. I mean, I'm borrowing now this, this term from Barnett uh, that I've introduced earlier. Um, non-integrating gap is uh, are all the countries that do not belong to the hegemonial powers, uh, to the functioning core. Or as Barnett would probably see it, um, Germany is somewhat halfway integrated or is, is integrated um, to some degree into the functional core or whatever. But the reality is Germany is not a hegemon and uh, it had developed this uh, hypocrisy towards military. Uh, we got the protection all from America. American soldiers uh, gave their lives uh, so that uh, the Soviets do not spread their powers. This is um, presented um, to the wider public as, you, look, these Americans are also militaristic. You know, look, America is also killing people. Ha <laughs> ha. And they go as far as to pre pretend that uh, you could actually do without military force in this day and age. I mean, uh, I'm not speaking about 300 years in, in future. Maybe we have sorted out all kind of things. But right now, we are not in a position when you can just disarm yourself and you can just let it go that all your animals will just fall in place and be nice to you. That's not the reality. And I think most of these people who pretend that um, you can just count the corpses, uh, they know better. They just want um, to find excuses to demonize America. And then there's uh, another factor in this, and that is um, for decades, there had been a constant affirmation for everything that sounded like Germans want peace, nice, cuddly, sweet peace after two world wars. This is what people wanted to hear. And it is understandable that this is what was rewarded most. If, if, if an artist went to England or to France or anywhere and said, um, you know, I'm making songs and poetry and books and novels and blah, 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 about how peaceful we should be and so on. They all will have uh, stepped on your shoulder and said, great job, that's what we need. Um, Germany has done so many bad things. It's time now for, for peace-loving nation and so on. It sounds so nice. We even had a winner of the Eurovision Song Contest, Nicole, uh, that sang that <laughs> very line um, as blatantly as possible and she won. She won with that. A little love, a little giving to build a dream from But this has a dire core to it because it is not only in post World War II history that just everybody was, you know, chiming in. Oh, you know, we are when I cut and nice. Uh, that's all fine. Um, it is actually something that um, is deep in our souls and that is actually quite dark. Um, and um, a sign of that can already be found in our national anthem. Uh, I don't really want to trash the national anthem, but it, uh, it starts with the word unity and the, all the emphasis is really on that. It's like unity and rights and freedom. Yeah, rights and freedom are also mentioned, but it's the, the, the melody really emphasizes on unity, okay? And this is a mirror of, uh, of our soul, basically, this lockstep mentality uh, that uh, actually leads to all these uh, terrible wars in the first place. Uh, that's a very difficult thing to explain uh, when interests are just ignored and, um, and we all are hectored all the time to be in unison and um, to align our interests, just naturally be nice already. Um, people do not learn how to discuss and um, they will turn violent over uh, some period of time at least. And uh, here's the proof in the pudding. Uh, you see some footage from the uh, movie, um, They Shall Not Grow Old, uh, which is about the First World War. And all these uh, young soldiers that were captured asked for was um, peace. Why are we even fighting? Why are we even fighting? And the problem is um, you wouldn't fight if you had asked before why you are walking in lockstep in the first place. 
um, it always takes so long for Germans to realize, oh, maybe that was too aggressive. Maybe we have gone too far in lockstep. I couldn't speak German, but uh, some could. And the Germans, some of them could speak English. Anyhow, we could understand each other. The general agreement when we were talking to Germans is how useless war was and why did it have to happen? In order to signal both inwards and outwards that we are now a nice, cuddly, uh, sweet, love, uh, lockstep, no conflicts nation. Um, our military has a lot of restrictions that make absolutely no sense to outsiders whatsoever. I'm reading to you the uh, entry or part of the entry of uh, Wikipedia's uh, description of the Bundeswehr. It says uh, the states of Germany are not allowed to maintain armed forces of their own since the German constitution states the matters of defense fall into the sole responsibility of the federal government. Uh, this seems unimportant and um, uh, yes, a constitution can uh, assign the responsibilities to this or that government entity. Um, that's all right, but it is it is kind of a security, and it becomes uh, more obvious when I give a second example. Uh, this one is not as clearly stated in the constitution, but it is more famous in, in Germany because we are reminded of it whenever French troopers uh, defuse a bomb or other uh, countries use the military. Uh, to do some work inside the country or when we have a natural catastrophe like a flood and we need the armed forces to, to help us uh, Then we are reminded of this and that is the provision that the uh, The military must never be used in uh, inside the country Tagesschau.de a website of the public broadcaster ARD writes the tasks of the military and the police are strictly separated in Germany after the historical experiences of the times of National Socialism. Um, the principle is still kept today. The Bundeswehr is in principle responsible for the defense of the country outwards, while the police is responsible for its inward security. This is also reflected in our constitution in Article 87. It says, among many things, uh, outside of uh, the defense, our um, our military forces can only be used in as far as this constitution expressively allows it. Um, that is a completely nonsensical sentence. Um, if you are into software development, there is a term called spaghetti code. That is when you have too many jump marks and uh, you cannot trace where, you know, where the computer um, follows what command after what command. I mean, after a while it gets a bit too complex and then nobody can read your code anymore. And German uh, legislation is like is like spaghetti code. You constantly refer to a different place only to confuse the reader. So all it says is, um, you know, we are taking really care. <laughs> we are very careful here. In reality, you can, of course, use our military inside the country in order to combat uh, floods or big fires or natural catastrophes and so forth. Uh, also, you know, for uh, um, combating terrorism, uh, there is a, a thing called um, Amtshilfe, which means um, aid in office. Uh, that allows uh, the military forces or any other authority to be used uh, under the uh, guiding of a, a different government authority. So um, in reality, of course, there are no restrictions, but um, this is presented to us as if they were. And what is more peculiar is that uh, <laughs> there is supposedly this lesson from history that uh, the military and the police must be separated or otherwise we will just end up like the like the Nazi regime. Uh, in many cases, we are presented with um, principles and restrictions as if they were of the highest order of uh, the highest importance, almost divine. Uh, and this sour tone or that um, we have learned this from history uh, always comes with that. Uh, a second example would be uh, that we have a, a pu almost purely ceremonial president. Uh, we have somehow learned from the Nazi era that uh, we need to have a completely useless government function. Um, and uh, what's what's funny is that um, neither of these uh, principles actually have anything to do with with history, with actual history. Uh, for example, Hitler's rights wouldn't have been stopped if the president had only ceremonial powers. 
Um, the problem was that Germans had no knowledge of democratic principles, no division of power, uh, or no ideas for uh, checks and balances and keeping each other in check. And so every institution gave him all the power. If the president were just a, a ceremonial role, you know, who cares? Then the, the other institutions would have granted him all the powers they have. Um, that is not the restriction that you need. Okay, this is not the lesson from history. And the same is also true for uh, this uh, rule that uh, the military and the police uh, must be separated. Yes, there have been combat units uh, from our police forces, but they were not under the military. They were um, officially aligned with the SS, which was the party militia of the NSDAP, Hitler's party. So um, the police was fighting in a military style way during the World War, but not for the Wehrmacht. So what separation of Wehrmacht and police would have stopped anything. Um, there was already a separation between Wehrmacht and police. So how is that a lesson? How is now insisting on a separation between police and military force a lesson from history? Um, then of course there is um, um, a lot of fuss over the, the proliferation of, of, of uh, weapons um, and um, and so on. I could I could go on and on and on. Um, for fun, I want to read out how the Wikipedia entry, the German language Wikipedia entry, um, sounds like in translation. Um, it's it goes. Uh, the Bundeswehr is a, a subordinate division of the Federal Ministry of Defense. It consists of the armed forces, military organization, the civil organization, as well as immediate subordinate depart departments without affiliation to one of the organizational areas. The armed forces consist of army, air force and navy. The army bases, uh, the central medical service and the division for cyber and information technology. The civil organization areas are equipment, IT, infrastructure, environmental protection and services, and human resources. They form the Bundeswehr administration, military chaplaincy, and the legal service. Hear me roar. <laughs> I mean, I just added hear me roar, but you get the idea. We are we are an administrative body. We are we are an office. You know, we sometimes hurt ourselves with the paper stables, and um, um, that's about it. Uh, don't be afraid. You know, we are just the military. In Article Twenty Six, it says activities that are capable and intended to disturb the peace of the people, in particular the preparation of an offensive war, are unconstitutional. They are to be punished. Um, just a note, if you are not a history buff, um, Hitler did not say, I'm going and uh, just uh, fight an offensive war against Poland. No, he claimed he was attacked. That's uh, that's not a help at all. It's not like you are not particularly careful only because you're claiming that you are careful and you're not nice, cuddly, sweet and, and so on only because everybody is in check and in line and in lockstep. That's not how it works. Okay, that's dumb. Um, the article goes on with uh, weapons of war uh, may only be manufactured with the permission of the federal government. The same applies to transport and proliferation. Specif specifics are given in ordinary laws. Uh, the latter sentence is quite interesting. It comes up again and again in the ins in the constitution. As I said, it's it's pure spaghetti code, um, and um, a constitution is usually said to be the framework with which. The people gives itself the ordinary laws. It's not a preview of what uh, the laws should be about. And this also sheds a light on um, how people don't really know what a constitution is, namely the limits to the state that um, must be defended uh, against the state. Um, and um, it is not a wish list. It is not just what um, high power people want and um, the, the ordinary laws that you can that you have a bigger chance to change with elections um, are just to follow from from the wish list. You know that's that's not what um, we as a Western people usually understand as the constitution, as the minimal consensus with which we rule ourselves. Um, so that the the basic misunderstanding shines through here already, and I think you already see as well. 
um, how there's no proliferation of weapons and uh, super suspicion and so on plays a role into the arrest of Franco Albrecht and also um, the witch hunts against all the people around him. And with all that long-standing distrust of our military, it should come as no surprise that we do have an intelligence agency that is specialized in looking into the thoughts of our military personnel. Um, it is called the uh, Militärische Abwehrdienst, uh, MAD. Uh, so it's called MAD, and uh, it means a military defense service. Um, I have mentioned uh, them in my third video on the thought crime um, evidence against Franco Albrecht. Um, they were looking into his master thesis um, and they ultimately cleared him, but uh, it says enough that, they, that we do have such an agency. But also remember that we are not just occupied with what our soldiers think, but also what our uh, citizens think. And the equivalent, the civilian equivalent of the military defense service is the uh, Verfassungsschutz, that's the intelligence service that spies on our thoughts and um, calls out people who are deemed extremists, even though that term is, is undefined. Um, and both these agencies are actually working together to form a, a, a work group they call a um, uh, Arbeitsgruppe Reservisten, that means a, a task force for uh, reservists, that is the military personnel or former military personnel that is on standby, that is in civilian life, but could be drawn into service uh, in a case of emergency. And for that, uh, the civilian intelligence agency and the military intelligence agency, which are um, designed to spy on our thoughts, <laughs> are cooperating. Um, both of these agencies do not exist in any Western nation outside Germany and Austria. And this level of uh, suspicion also extends to everybody who bears weapons. There is a new gun law. Um, uh, just uh, passed a few weeks ago that requires that whenever you purchase a gun you don't only have to tell exactly what you need it for if you're a collector if you're a hunter if you're uh, taking part in competitions uh, shooting competitions um, or whatever use you have you have to declare the use and it's only given to you for five years and after that you, you have to explain again why you still need a weapon and not only that if you ask for a gun license you now have to show that uh, you have the permission of the Verfassungsschutz um, the civilian intelligence agency that you are not a so-called extremist so um, Buying a weapon requires that an intelligence agency um, clears your name. And again, a state looking into the thought crimes of its citizens is not a Western concept. This is not how a Western nation um, acts normally. And when our elites claim we were a democracy and our political system were shaped in the image of the United States, they are blatantly lying. I want to show you a video from the show Panorama um, that talks about Marco G. Um, I use the same uh, the same episode, the same um, video that I also um, use in my third episode of this series uh, discussing the social environment of Franco Albrecht. Uh, Marco G was the administrator of the chat group Nordkreuz, which belongs to the Hannibal network. Uh, Südkreuz was another chat room of the same group and uh, that was Südkreuz was the one that Franco Albrecht participated in. I think there is no direct connection between Marco G and Franco Albrecht, but um, I talked about uh, Marco G's case as well. He also sat in custody, uh, or possibly still sits in custody um, for similar crimes. He was uh, hiding weapons um, and stole some ammunition and some weapons. Um, and um, this is what they uh, said about him after the first raid into his home. He had two raids. And uh, the first raid was, um, you know, came up with uh, le lesser crimes than the second one. Um, and uh, this is what they had to say about him. Ein Polizist, der sich mit anderen auf den Zusammenbruch der staatlichen Ordnung vorbereitet. 
Genau das ist es, was Verfassungsschützer alarmiert. Wenn Staatsdiener dem Staate nicht mehr vertrauen. Wer in, der, in den Sicherheitsbehörden der Bundesrepublik Deutschland, egal ob auf Bundesebene oder Landesebene tätig ist, äh, der sollte schon davon überzeugt sein, dass erstens mal dieser Staat und diese Gesellschaft es wert sind, äh, aufrechterhalten und verteidigt zu werden, insbesondere der Rechtsstaat. Aber wer im Grunde genommen schon die Vorstellung hat, dass das Ganze dem Untergang geweiht ist, der hat eigentlich in diesen Behörden nichts zu suchen. The lady speaking the voice over says that a servant to the state must be faithful or trusting in the state. Uh, this is a statement that is so stupid you would never hear it in a real democracy because um, the whole point of a democracy is to stop a tyranny or dictatorship from arising and that means the population should be always suspicious of the authorities and should question them. Um, and keep the powers in check. That's the whole point, right? And if Germans had learned from history as they claim in ceremonial hours, um, they would never accept this. Uh, but it is not just a one-off comment she makes. Uh, this is something deeply ingrained in our souls. And um, there's even, of course, a legal framework around this um, that's called a Mäßigungsgebot, uh, which means uh, a commandment to um, um, restriction. Um, it means that um, public uh, officials may not just say what they want, they always have to measure their tone, they have to be careful what they say. This sounds like um, reasonable, you know, it's, it's fussy enough that uh, a nice authority can, uh, can let you say some things and uh, you do not know when it bites, you know, when is that moment when suddenly what you say is no longer considered to be moderate and nice and and reasonable and in, in line. Um, you are always, uh, you, you have no, no clear boundaries of uh, what you can think and say and so on. And our uh, society and the legal structure makes it very clear that we have no clear rights. We are always dependent on arbitrary rule. Um, you can sometimes say whatever you want, but you never know when suddenly you don't anymore, okay? The last person that you hear speak is Stefan Kramme, who is the head of Verfassungsschutz in uh, Thuringen. Verfassungsschutz has uh, state offices and uh, the federal office. Um, he is only the head of a state office. Um, Thuringen is the state of Germany. I have mentioned him already in the second video, um, providing the evidence that the left puts out uh, against um, uh, Mr. Albrecht. And uh, I did mention him because he is on board of the dubious uh, Amadeo Antonio Foundation. Um, there is this uh, claim that Franco Albrecht may have uh, wanted to assassinate the head of that foundation, Mrs. Uh, Kahane. Um, she is not a nice person and um, uh, Mr. Kramer is neither. <laughs> And so when he says that um, you can no longer serve the state if you do not trust the state, he clearly, uh, you know, reflects the attitude of our intelligence uh, agencies. It shows that um, they are not looking into extremists, as they officially claim, not into people that constantly burn cars and smash windows and Antifa, basically, and Islamists. Um, no, uh, they are actually more concerned about people that may challenge uh, our elites, of course, um, and they just bully you into trusting them. That's their vision of uh, of democracy. There's barely a terminology that reflects better on our <laughs> lack of uh, democratic understanding than the term uh, streitbare Demokratie. Uh, the word streitbar is a bit difficult to explain because it only appears in Bible translations for words that uh, mean robust or military or militant. Um, and um, it appears in this very phrase. And what it does mean is that um, we think um, other nations had no experience in dictatorship and tyranny and persecutions and that um, after the Hitler regime, Germans had to do something, something more than all people around us to protect us against tyranny. And that is basically to remove all freedoms uh, in instance when uh, the population does not behave in the interests of the elites. Uh, that's a very peculiar understanding of democracy and um, Wikipedia details that uh, as follows. Um, as tools of the Streitbare Demokratie, 
uh, they use the the term word in the English um, um, entry because uh, there is it's really difficult to translate. Um, it usually means battle. It means prepared for warfare, and it only really appears in Bible translations. Um, and uh, it says several articles of the German Constitution allow a range of different measures to defend the liberal uh, democratic order. Article 9 allows for social groups to be labeled verfassungsfeindlich. Uh, that means hostile to the uh, Constitution. That's correct, the translation. And to be uh, prescribed by the federal government. Political parties can only be labeled enemies to the Constitution by Germany's highest court, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, the Supreme Court, our constitutional court. And now this is uh, peculiar for obvious reason because uh, the judges are staffed by the parties. Uh, obviously they are elected by the parliamentarians um, who have their own interests and therefore they will always um, destroy all upcoming opposition uh, no matter what. We have one party that was completely forbidden that was a communist party and even though i'm not a communist not at all i uh, i find it horrid that we uh, we accept that entire political parties are just simply forbidden and uh, people are deprived of their basic rights to freedom of association and freedom of assembly and of course this goes on into different um, you know, prohib prohibitions for for um, diverse groups, uh, be it biker groups or, um, I mean, mob mob groups um, that that are problematic, obviously. Uh, but um, you cannot control that, okay? And it is not the way a democracy defends itself. The way a democracy defends itself is strong police work is to investigate crimes uh, thoroughly uh, and not allow um, human traffickers and drug traffickers and so on uh, to continue their work um, and also to combat bad ideas with better ideas. That's um, enough of a protection. You do not need to outlaw um, groups as a whole. You do not give that much power to the state. It is unnecessary and of course it just means that a group that uh, is is hostile can, can infiltrate uh, other groups long enough until they take power and then they crush down on the competing groups. This is not protecting a society against tyranny, it's rather the opposite. And the justification for banning this or that group is that um, the group um, works against the interests of a goal already stated in our constitution. Very problematic because our constitution is bloated with a hell load of things. It is a wish list and it is growing. There are, there are constant new demands for um, new amendments to the constitution. Um, for example, LGBT rights should be included. Um, we have animal rights uh, movements. Um, there is uh, a lot of pseudo human rights uh, issues that, uh, that are, you know, used to litter the constitution, which I think is a problem in itself because if everything is important, nothing is important and nobody reads the constitution anymore. And the last, uh, the last move is uh, they want uh, children's protection, the protection of children in the constitution. This all sounds very nice from the onset, uh, like the equality for women. It sounds so nice and um, it, it, it is never meant to be nice. The protection of children is just to pit the children against their parents. It is, it is to remove children from their, from their homes in case of a supposed emergency. In some cases you do need the state to take action when, for example, a parent lets uh, his own children starve or is um, committing rape or whatever. Um, there are horrible things, obviously, but you know, nothing rises to the level that you need constitutional rights to children because the rights are actually the defense mechanism uh, against uh, the state. It is, it is exactly uh, drawing the line in the sand what the state must not do with the individuals. It is, it is the warning sign, the, the primary warning sign that things uh, go out of control. Um, and 
you ha you need adults. You need adults to fight off a tyranny. Children will never fight uh, against a tyranny. Um, the whole point of, of rights is not understood. The Wikipedia goes on explaining the, the streitbare Demokratie, the defensive democracy or battlesome or fighting democracy. Um, according to Article 18, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, that's the Supreme Court, our constitutional court, uh, can restrict the basic rights of people who fight against the Verfassungs gemäße Ordnung, constitutional order. As of 2018, this has never happened in the history of the Federal Republic, and as I've already explained, that's wrong, that's uh, blatantly wrong, uh, that had happened. Um, and if you deprive uh, enemies of their rights, you are already actually showing that you, your true nature, which is not a democratic nature. The next point is the federal and state bureaucracies can exclude people deemed hostile to the constitution from civil service uh, according to Article 33. Uh, that is a ban. Uh, a professional ban, Berufsverbot. Uh, of course, uh, professional bans are also commonplace in dictatorships. Uh, for example, the East German communist regime uh, banned a lot of oppositional activists from working. Uh, the same is true, of course, from uh, of the Nazis who are banned um, uh, in actors from, from the stages across the country and as well as uh, writers from publishing books. Um, and so on and so on. The more somebody can have exposure to a any clientele or a wider public and audience, uh, the more likely he is to be banned from his work. Um, and in order to, you know, um, put German civil servants into into line in our supposed republic today, um, they have to swear an oath to the constitution, which of course is fine and they should they should um, swear an oath to the constitution of course the problem is that our constitution is no longer that minimal consensus that uh, the western world um, upholds it's it's more like an expanding wish list that's full of um, pseudo rights like animal rights children rights um, uh, women's rights and so on and so on and so on and of course it defies the idea of rights as an alarming system the civil servants uh, shall actually be <laughs> um, be disobedient in the case that our authorities do no longer abide to those principles of the constitution that's why they should um, make that oath if animals have rights you you are no longer asked to protect uh, freedom against against the state. Uh, this is not a warning signal. And animals, um, you know, whatever happens to animals, it it never amounts to the to to the point where people um, uh, rush to the arms and fight off their government. Uh, this is you know the alarm system idea really is uh, is falling apart. And this is even more concerning considering that our constitution also has a provision that asks the citizenry to fight off a potentially uh, freedom smothering force. <clears throat> that is Article 20. And uh, yes, as a last resort, we are allowed to use violence. However, if the definition of you know what a government overreach is is bloating and everything is a, a right and have highest importance and so on you create a, a mood for a civil war everybody is self-righteous and says my right to marry another man and so on is just as important as your freedom to to speak to assemble and to make use of your uh, of your political freedoms to form a uh, whatever interest group of your liking, then um, you, you are creating a hostile environment and you do so very quickly. Um, another problem with that article is that we see now the left um, claiming that everybody on the conservative side is a potential threat to the constitution. Uh, this has been going on for quite some time now and um, as we are moving towards um, more hostility, um, this becomes a, a real problem. 
um, Boris Johnson is is called uh, a potential tyrant only because he asks for a long overdue holiday of the parliament and Donald Trump is accused of depriving citizens of their rights but the left does not bother to explain itself so you have to guess what rights he's actually um, depriving people of they do not bother to explain um, and this is a problem if you if you actually invoke an article uh, or the the sentiment that we as a as a people have to fight off a regime and call for resistance um, when there is nothing um, that that is of course that's amounting to a big problem and could result in a civil war. Meanwhile, the left is attacking the core the core of the constitution, which is the participation and the the, the means of participation for every in individual citizen to form groups and follow their interests peacefully. But um, despite that article and despite the left exploiting that um, that sentiment uh, of resistance against <laughs> Donald Trump, um, it is not really um, in the psyche of the Germans to um, to rise up against uh, an authority. Uh, Vladimir Lenin, um, the Russian Bolshevik, has once joked if uh, Germans are asked to storm the, the train station, they will buy tickets. Um, that's very often quoted because it reflects so well on our general <laughs> sentiment, which is uh, rather obedient. I must say. And of course this is also institutionalized, it is a, there's a cultural heritage that points to this and uh, what conservatives in, in Germany used to say uh, against all these uh, uh, pseudo-revolutionaries on the political left uh, was that the state uh, holds the monopoly on power. That is a phrase um, that was used as a normative statement, you know, that should be the case, the state is to say uh, when somebody gets locked up in prison and when somebody uh, gets uh, fought off the border and so on. It's just the authority that says it and you Che Guevara fan, uh, you sit down and be quiet. That was the uh, conservative <laughs> line here in Germany for, for quite some time. And uh, it, it goes back to misunderstanding because a monopoly on power, uh, as it was defined by sociologist uh, Max Weber, uh, was used to be a descriptive, um, a descriptive term um, to explain statehood. Uh, Wikipedia writes, um, the monopoly on, on violence uh, or the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force is a Gewaltmonopol, sorry I just checked the term word, is a core concept of uh, modern public law which goes back to Jean Baudin's uh, 1576 work uh, Le Six Livre de la République and uh, Thomas Hobbes' book, um, 1651 book uh, Leviathan. At uh, the defining conception of the state it was first described uh, in sociology by Max Weber in his essay uh, Politics as a Vocation. Despite the quotes of all these uh, theorists it is in reality um, a, a terminology that goes back to Max Weber. Wikipedia explains uh, the term as follows. Max Weber's definition of a state if and insofar as its administrative staff successfully upholds a claim on the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force in the enforcement of its order. And that's of course a gobbledygook for um, if your troops occupy a place then it's yours. When you when you have your troops in, in some place you establish some order, you say what people can do and what they cannot do. And um, this in itself, your legitimate punishment for, transgress for transgressors, um, that is stated, that is uh, def defining um, you as uh, as the authority that and your statehood um, is uh, you know is created by the legitimacy of your punishment. Uh, that means you can whip somebody, you can lock somebody up, um, what whatever um, you can do something that some person does not like, but you have enough legitimacy among the wider group. Uh, this legitimacy does not necessarily have to be. 
um, based on a moral set. Uh, it does not have to be based on um, your your call to or uh, a divine order. Um, it can just mean that you you create the pretense of legitimacy. In other words, enough people have to believe that what you do against the interests or the wishes of some individuals is good. People must believe that your force is good to define you as the authority and to give you statehood. That is how uh, Max Weber defines it and it is a descriptive term. It is not how things should be. Wikipedia also notes uh, he, he introduced the statement as a contemporary observation noting that the connection between the state and the use of physical force has not always been so close. He uses the example of feudalism uh, where private warfare was permitted under certain conditions and of religious courts uh, which had sole jurisdiction over some types of offenses, especially heresy and uh, sex crimes, thus the nickname body courts. Um, regardless, the state exists uh, wherever a single authority can legitimately authorize violence. So, for example, on a pirate ship, the, the captain is uh, the the state um, is is the authority and therefore creates a state of his own. Also from Wikipedia, uh, for the same uh, reasons, the monopoly does not mean that only the government uh, may use physical force, but that the state is that human community that successfully claims for itself to be the only source of legitimacy for all physical coercion or adjudication of coercion. Uh, for example, the law might permit individuals to use force in defense of one's self or property, but this right derives from the state's authority. This conflict, and this is now this in the interesting part, this conflicts directly with enlightenment principles of individual sovereignty that delegates power to the state by consent and concepts of natural law that hold that individual rights deriving from sapient self-ownership pre-exist the state and are only recognized and guaranteed by the state which may be restricted from limiting them by constitutional law. Um, <laughs> the interesting part here is citation needed. Okay, why is that interesting? And the interesting part is that uh, the last sentence was added by an English speaker and somebody who grew up in English speaking culture. This was not written by a French person who speaks uh, English well. This was not written by an Arab. This was not written by a Chinese person. Uh, this is most certainly a left leaning uh, person who grew up in the English speaking world. And how can I tell that? Because he read anything that went before that and then he noticed that the the notion of the statehood and the legitimacy and stuff that is not derived from God but it's just force that this collides with his internal compass okay his own moral justification there is something more even though he may deny God's existence uh, or whatever he knows there must be more than just a suck claiming authority and punishing people with enough people consenting to that punishment. There must be more. There's some legitimacy in a statehood. There's something of importance, isn't there? And so he writes, it must be against something that is deeply important to me. And because he is not a conservative, I can tell that he just uh, pulled up that enlightenment thing. Okay, so there is no quotation because enlightenment isn't a thing, okay? Enlightenment is, is the period in history or whatever. It is usually a reference to, um, yeah, some, some gobbledygook for um, nice important things that we cannot explain anymore because we're too uneducated. And um, he cannot say, well, this is the English speaking tradition that uh, the king uh, has no right over the ordinary citizen because we all are endowed by our Lord with equal unalienable rights. Well, there is something deep inside him that goes against that notion that just somebody can claim authority without any reason at all, that there is no deeper reason at all. And you, you know from that sentence that this guy 
grew up in a free society, may rebel a bit against it, but okay, it, it makes a difference from which culture you actually come from. And this guy who added this without a quotation just came from a free culture. The general idea in continental Europe and everywhere else is of course that there is no such thing as a legitimate rebellion. Um, the article 20 in the German constitution that uh, speaks of uh, our right to fight off uh, threatening uh, forces against our freedoms. That is just included because we signal to the outside world that we were a Western nation. That's not what we deeply feel inside. We usually abhor statements like that of Thomas Jefferson that says uh, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with a plot of patriots and tyrants. And even more so because um, patriotism is such a horrible, arrogant thing. We Germans are so humble, we are so humble. We would never ever uh, think of ourselves as superior to anybody else, just above those who think they are patriots. So what we see is a highly neurotic, paranoid elite class that tries to grab our guns, take away our freedoms and silence us into submission. I want to return to that conversation at UC San Diego and give the floor to uh, Barbara Walter, who I think voices best um, the current um, uh, fears of the political left. So they're well stocked. Their training, their training for um, you know warfare for defense. They have um, uh, they have a very clear um, motivation and objective. It's they're going to fight against what they call government overreach. Um, and you know, of course, that could be interpreted in lots of different ways. It could be that a president comes to power who they disagree with, um, and and then. Um, you know, basically um, begins enacting laws that they disagree with. So, I, you know, that's that's how I see it happening here. I think it's a low probability event as well. I don't think it's zero. And you do have a subset of the population that is deeply aggrieved and is stockpiling the weapons um, and I think is going to be very difficult to, um, you know, negotiate with, right? So what are the concessions you can offer this group, these groups to keep them at peace? What is most frightening of what she says is that uh, she does not see any space for a compromise. Uh, there's only... Um, a fear that it may escalate, but they do nothing to de-escalate the situation. I see no effort on the political left to de-escalate the situation. Um, I would come up with a hundred of ways to compromise, uh, but she also has actually an idea. Well, we know that most the the, the, the relatively new militias that have been growing since 2008 their rallying cry um, is basically keep the government out of my life. So she does understand it. So my question and the one that many ask right now is why can't the left compromise? Why is it only on us to compromise? They know exactly what we want. We say precisely what we want. We want to keep our guns. We want to um, speak our minds. We want to um, 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 make contracts freely, trade freely, um, live in a free society, um, keep our properties. It is very clear what our demands are. Our demands are actually things that used to be the norm until fairly recently. Why is that so difficult to compromise on? Why does she think, and why does the left think in general, that this is nothing they can compromise on? Particularly since they claim that all we want is just to um, remain in a, in a current state or, in a, or return to a previous state. If that state, that previous state or that current state is not that bad, why is it so difficult for them to restore that situation? Why can't they compromise? What is it? Um, and what, you know, my question would also be, what do they want 
that we would have to compromise so that they stop stop attacking our core values and the things that we hold most dear like our families our country and our freedom what do they want as an epilogue i want to make uh, a few notes um i have um, dug into a lot of media sources and of course they are terribly unreliable i give you uh, a few examples of what i've discovered since um i compiled uh, the information for uh, videos and recorded some in between and then additionally um, did some further research into into more and what I just dis uh, discovered of course uh, new information sometimes contradicted old and here are some few corrections for example I have found actually a picture of that swastika that is attributed to Franco Albrecht in my third video on his thought crimes I explained how they found a swastika on a gun case for the G36 I said this gun case probably belongs to um, the, the weapon that Franco Albrecht gave to a friend Ma uh, Matthias F um, my reasoning for this is um, that one um, is most it's more likely to uh, make amendments to things um, to to or uh, stuff that one actually owns so I assumed he had a G36 for himself and that a gun case that uh, has the swastika in engraved is his mm. there is a witness that says the gun case is not his I cannot trust that I, I personally don't trust this witness I think it is uh, Mr. Albrecht's gun case and he actually made that swastika um, I have a photo of that and um, as you see the description um, that uh, Spiegel Online put out as the fastidiously engraved swastika in term uh, akribisch eingerotztes hakenkreuz is uh, <laughs> is a very off the mark this is some board scratching this is not some artwork it is not uh, fastidiously uh, done as uh, spiegel claims uh, so here we have false information again uh, Spiegel has also created a character I did not make this mistake in the previous videos but I've just noticed this uh, <laughs> while I was uh, doing some additional research uh, they have created a character uh, called uh, Matthias T um, with a double T um, that is probably the composition of Matthias F uh, the youth friend of Franco Albrecht that uh, was keeping the gun um, the mentioned gun uh, of the gun case with a swastika uh, on it uh, and of course Max Tischer uh, the brother-in-law uh, so um, Matthias T is Max Tischer and uh, Matthias F <laughs> also Spiegel has now um, lifted the miracle of the Wehrmacht soldier poster or as it was uh, described Lanza poster I've already explained in my video on the thought crime allegations that Lanza is a neo-nazi band and um, the word has not been used for an infantry soldier for for decades it is a misleading um, uh, description but um, there is more to it actually this poster is not in this room it is uh, in the bar of uh, the military base and it isn't a poster <laughs> It is actually artwork. It is um, a, a, a mural on the wall. Uh, they actually painted on the wall an image of a soldier. So that is the Lanza poster um, that was supposedly found in his room and it wasn't found in his room. What was found in his room is a, a, a copper sketch um, and here you have a photo of that. Um, it's also a piece of art. It is there because Franco Albrecht is a collector of old stuff. That's all there is <laughs> so this is the media situation it makes it difficult for research i hope you still enjoyed uh, the series um, and i think i will do the, a similar uh, in-depth uh, research in future um, if you enjoy that uh, don't forget to like share and subscribe also uh, you know across many platforms change the platforms distribute it uh, through whatever means you find um, and i uh, see you soon bye